just to get an idea, how many of you here would consider yourselves emerging filmmakers in the sense that you're working now on your first full-length doc? Okay, so quite a, quite a few. How many of you are from outside the greater New York metropolitan area? Great, welcome. Um, I am. I'm based in a small town in Maine, about 25 miles north of Portland, not exactly the media metropolis, but in this day and age, we've all learned that it is possible to be uh, living in other places and having slightly different lives than you might in a place like this big city. Um, I'm here because I work as a, in a kind of hybrid fashion. I spent many years as a distributor of finished films. I started out in public television at WGBH. I started my own business. I was a distributor for 15 years with children's programs, arts programming, drama, um, indie features, and then made the decision for a number of reasons to focus on nonfiction and to start working with filmmakers at an earlier stage um, to help them in the first instance, get their projects funded through uh, pre-sales to television. Um, certainly over the last 15 years, the business has changed, television has changed. Um, I would say now as much uh, of what I do is advising on business strategy for fundraising uh, because television pre-sales can no longer uh, provide the larger chunks that they used to. So we'll get into that. I have a um, I have a bit of a presentation that I hope will uh, help us get rolling or stay on track, and I also hope that we'll have time for uh, some conversation later. If you have a burning question in the midst, please raise your hand because I think it'll help keep it, um, you know, keep it focused on where you want to go with this and the information that you're looking for. Um, you know, just quickly to say about ideas, we could, you know, we could spend three hours, uh, you know, talking about this. Um, Viability, originality, and exclusivity. Uh, I can't emphasize enough how important it is if you're not making a personal film that quite obviously only you would have access to, um, you really do need to do some research about what else is out there. And not just what else is out there in current terms, but what's been made before. And as North American filmmakers, you cannot disregard um, work that is being done elsewhere. We have a very, you know, we live on a big continent, we have a myopic view here, um, but bear in mind that the documentary community and the rest of the world has really come on like gangbusters in the last number of years, and uh, we've all seen films from, uh, from many different countries appearing at festivals in North America that are having huge impacts on subject areas that I suppose in some ways used to be thought of as the province of uh, the Brits and the Americans. So you need to do some research. Um, you need to think about your target audience and um, who will pay for the film in the end and that would include a range of uh, television, community groups, um, the educational institutions who might have a use for it, nonprofits and NGOs who, um, who might be able to make use of the film, start to develop an idea of who would buy it, who would watch it. Um, that is going to influence how you approach various aspects of your, your project. Um, do your homework. I mean, there is so much information that is available online. Um, you can look at the websites for networks rather than going to someone and saying, so do you think Sundance Channel would buy this? You can actually go look at the grid, look at the programming grid, or if you think that an NGO might have an eventual end use for it, you know, really make sure that you're familiarizing yourself with what are they doing now. That, of course, can change, but it's good for you to have an idea of what their history is. Um, attending events like this, uh, where you start to get the buzz of projects that are in the works or in the air, um, going to festivals, you know, keeping, keeping your ear to the ground in all ways is very important. Um, <clears throat> important to really um, remember that your professional development is going to be key to um, so many things as you're going forward, since so many of you here are in that emerging filmmaker category. Um, invest the time and invest the money in um, attending workshops and conferences. You may hear certain things repeated, but it's still worthwhile getting a perspective on distribution, on financing, on... I noticed that one of the uh, workshops here is about editing and the paragraph says, you know, what do you do if there are 300 hours of footage? Uh -oh. um, 
very important to get some perspective from colleagues as well as uh, people more experienced than you. Um, Look for events uh, both near and far. I mean, obviously this is an investment, but if you have made the decision that there's a film festival that you'd like to attend and another one you'd like to attend, and one of them is offering a conference that's got some good people in attendance, I'd go less for the parties and more for what you can pick up on at the, uh, at the conferences. Um, there are events that focus more on editorial than on business, and... Um, uh, or certainly lend that, uh, that element to the discussion. And that is definitely um, worthwhile. If you see yourself as a science producer or a history producer, um, you need to be in tune with what, uh, what people whose specialty is in that genre are doing and what they're thinking about. And um, make the point of researching what's out there that you can gain access to. There are a lot of events that, um, uh, even if they are a pitching session that you have the option of attending as a observer. And uh, for example, hot docs, even if you're not selected to pitch, you, you can apply for an observer seat. Same thing with IDFA. Um, you know, history makers and some of these paid conferences are another story where you're paying a registration fee and it may seem hefty, but judging by who is attending, who you might be able to network with, it might be worthwhile. And don't discount, again, just from this editorial standpoint, um, reaching out to other filmmakers who are working in the genre that you would like to be working in, whether they are science filmmakers or, um, again, using history as a reference, uh, or filmmakers making personal films. Um, you will find, if you approach people in a professional way, um, they've all been where you are and um, are often quite generous with their time and the idea of providing some mentorship because someone did it for them and they're paying it forward too. Um, think about what would be referred to more as marketplaces and meat markets. Um, uh, this meat market term coined by the Brits whose sense of irony is always so wonderful. Um, You've got a little bit of that going on here, of course, with the documentary uh, meetings, the one-on-one -on -one meetings. Um, but look for these opportunities where your idea can be discussed in a professional context. It's giving you uh, an opportunity to kind of, ch you know, test test the concept, see how people react to it. Um, and as you begin to get more confident. Um, your, your underlying research is starting to feel solid. You've got a good grip on your, uh, your description. Um, start to make those applications for these slots that will allow you to have some of those meetings um, and prepare for them. Do your homework. Um, format and budget, this is a big consideration right now. Um, every meeting that I've had here, and I would say in, in the last day and a half, I've, I've probably had maybe eight or ten filmmaker meetings um, over at the, uh, the Ethical Culture Society building. Um, one of the first things that comes up is, yes, you're making a feature documentary, but you're also planning for the hour, right? Um, this is not even a question anymore, that, that um, of course you, you want a feature length film for festivals, but you must, must have simultaneous with the availability of your feature version, at least a rough cut of the hour. And this is because there are many more slots open and available in the television environment and there is more funding from educational uses and, and so forth that um, uh, will take hour long or even shorter versions but will not necessarily take a feature length version. So you need to show that you're prepared to be adaptable and flexible, that you can think of your material being used in a variety of ways. This in some ways echoes what a lot of the folks working in the whole transmedia uh, environment are, are urging you to think about too, which is how to, how to rethink uh, your approach and your material to make it adapt across platforms. Um, and bear in mind, um, different budgets for different funding scenarios uh, I've looked at some budgets in the last day and a half that have been shockingly low. Uh, I hate to say it, but, but all decision makers on a certain level will equate quality with price. And if you don't value your time and the energy that you've invested in it, they won't either. 
Um, so I'm not saying take something that in cash out of pocket terms you've spent $20,000 on and call it a half a million dollar film, but somewhere in your documentation of what the film is costing is your time and the time of the other people around you um, and make sure that that budget exists somewhere even if you have your other can-do budget which is the real cash need that the project has to get finished. Um, you need to be able to turn on a dime sometimes to come up with these different budget versions but it's very important to be able to do so. Um, also be aware that um, Europe and the U.S. have a bit of a gap in terms of how they think about the financing of films. I won't get into um, too much detail here, but um, we've been acculturated through um, a certain funding environment and oftentimes um, when, when decision makers are comparing things, they will say, well, in Europe we would make that less expensively. Um, you know, take a hard look at what you're doing, talk to people about budgets, this is the kind of information that if filmmakers share it with one another and, and you start operating within these you know, zones of thinking, um, again, you'll be much more fluid in being able to talk about it and to defend your budget. Um, also very challenging if you have a project that is using archive material or um, music that needs to be licensed, any kind of third party material. Very difficult and very scary for decision makers to um, see a number that is not specific. And uh, you need to be as on top of that information as you can in order to again convey that, um, that sense of professionalism. Uh, you need to have quotes, you need to think about are you going to use, uh, um, impose fair use on the project? Um, do you already have a relationship established with a third party source? Is there anybody who you can you know, get a particularly good deal with um, and, and represent that as a sign of confidence in the project, um, that someone else believes in you, they're willing to provide this material to the project because they do. Um, but have a grip on, on, on the dollars and cents and you know, don't, don't turn up at an event like this saying that the budget for the film is $20,000. Um, the competition, this kind of circles back on uh, the, the, the discussion that we, the, 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 the words that I, I mentioned earlier about searching out um, who else has done what in that same space that you're wanting to be in. There are a lot of databases available to you and um, with certain iconic topics, um, let's say uh, the atomic bomb, um, it, it really behooves you to go to some of the international databases and make sure that you know what's been made in the last five years, not just the last two years. Um, know, who, know what else is out there, know what else has made the rounds. Um, not that you're ever going to diss someone else's film, but you do want to be able to position your own in that environment and say, well, what makes my project different is X, Y, and Z. Um, just to mention a little bit more about um, uh, some of these databases, the Telco Report, which is based in, in uh, Santa Monica, California, um, is a kind of little known, what used to be called a programmer's tip sheet. Um, you have to pay them to do a search for you, although sometimes they're very kind people and they'll just do it out of the goodness of their heart. Um, uh, but they carry data from a range of international networks and producers. Um, uh, so it's not just distribution companies that are supplying them with information. And they can go back quite a ways. Their database goes back. You can't access it from the outside, but you can pay them 50 bucks or whatever to um, have them do a search for you. Um, some of these are European, the, the European Documentary Network. I don't know um, if any of you are familiar with that very worthwhile becoming a member of EDN, um, if only for the fact that they publish a, uh, a guidebook to financing that gives you contact information um, and pricing figures for a range of European networks. Also gives you a great overview on what their slots are like and, and the kind of programming that um, each individual commissioner is looking for. Um, so I would definitely recommend the membership, but you can also search their database. 
Real Screen Magazine, same thing. Um, very much oriented towards more of the commercial television environment, but they do cover single docs and indie feature docs extensively. Um, so worth checking them out. Real Azor, which is part of um, Documentary Campus Master School, a training program in Europe, but you can also um, uh, be a part of it. So all of these are tools um, uh, to help you be on top of what's in the marketplace. Um, OK. <laughs> um, very difficult when, um, when people come to me with a quite high profile topic. And I get the sense that they've got some good access, but they have not done anything to nail down uh, their access and their exclusivity. Um, even with quite famous people, with authors, um, with renowned academics, it's quite possible to get an agreement from them of, let's say, initially a one-year duration to allow you to exclusively use their work and their profile uh, in a long-form documentary. It won't stop them from doing news pieces or short news magazine pieces, but in terms of long-form, you really need to have that nailed down. If, you're, if your project pivots on uh, access to that person or their work, it's, it's something you really have to do. It'll be one of the first questions that will uh, be asked by certain of your funders. And um, it's better to be able to have a confident answer. Um, also, exclusivity could also be in the category of access to a certain location or to certain archive material. So it is a strong selling point uh, that will be critical in, in the funding of the film. So being able to say that you have an exclusive element is important. Funding. Um, there is no question that in today's marketplace, funding is very incremental. Um, it, it is relying on small building blocks being pieced together one by one. There are, are very few large lump sums, and when they do come, they tend to be closer to the end of your process. So the question of how do you begin you know, establishing these building blocks, and I would say you have to first look locally. You have to look for local funding sources, and I don't mean you know, your Uncle Dan the dentist. I, I mean um, even the smallest uh, historical societies, arts councils, um, you know, you may be starting in $1,000 increments, uh, $500 increments, and then building your way up. But that is the way that we all have to do it now. And um, uh, important not to disregard any of those smaller sums. And you don't need to apologize for it because this all helps build your credibility. And that is the thing, ultimately, is creating that critical mass of credibility that gets you to the next step and the next step. Um, how many here have uh, experimented in crowdfunding? And how many have reached their goal? That's great. Um, anybody gone over $10,000 as, as their goal? OK. <clears throat> so we had three hands in the audience, uh, FYI, for, for the greater than $10,000. Um, crowdfunding is important, and it's helpful. It makes a statement. Uh, it says something about the extent to which you're, you know, tapped into the zeitgeist. Um, but it's, uh, it, again, it's part of the incremental solution. Um, and, and this is, I think, one of the things that's become so challenging for indies is that you are having to do so much work, um, you know, to push that boulder up the mountain. But, um, again, that's a piece of the credibility puzzle, if you want to call it that. Um, private investors, I increasingly see um, lists of investors on um, finance plans and, and uh, listed on uh, budget outlines. Um, they're important. They play an important part. What can be helpful is to only be prepared to take their money through a fiscal sponsor so that you establish that firewall between you, the project, and the money. Um, if they are going to do it as a genuine investor, 
then you are going to need some legal and accounting advice on that. And you know, I think you just have to approach that in a fully informed way. Um, I'm not an expert on private investment, so I'm not going to stand here and, and pretend to be. But um, do be careful. Understand that if you're dealing with a journalistic type of subject, um, private investment uh, may, in, in, in the case of certain end users, be regarded with a little bit of concern. And again, you just need to be able to answer that. So f having a fiscal sponsor can provide a lot of benefits in, in a variety of ways. And if you're going after grant money anyway, in a lot of cases you need that fiscal sponsor. So establish a relationship, make that potential fiscal sponsor feel that you're not going to be hanging them out to dry when it comes to the paperwork that they need to do the accounting overview. Be prepared to give them what they need because in the end, you know, the 5% or whatever that you're going to pay them for that service, it'll be very worthwhile. Um, large amounts, as I said at the beginning, are very hard to come by these days. Um, and by large, you know, I'm talking, uh, let, let's, let's say for the sake of argument, anything over $60,000 is, uh, it, it's, a tough, it's a tough prospect now. Um, Certainly, you're all aware that um, at the end stages of your post-production, getting completion funding is a possibility, and it's possible in larger amounts. Um, part of what you're also interested in is can you get someone to spring for some of these bigger sums earlier on? And this is where preparing for um, certain kinds of uh, events and uh, let's say uh, uh, if you have a project here, for example, what you have available to present and show becomes very important. Now, when you're submitting material to a grant-giving organization or to a, um, let's say, independent film week to be included in the Docs in Progress section, um, they have a format for how they want your information laid out. You also separately need to have your own proposal materials, they, they need to look professional, they need to be visual, they, you, you need to be ready with a variety of materials to appeal to different appetites. And we always start out with the small description and move out from there. Um, so you got to be able to sell it in the two paragraphs, in the two pages, and then in the full proposal and be prepared to think that way. And as you go through any of these funding processes, you will, in a sense, be asked to be making different versions of your same material, but this is essential. Um, don't simply recycle each time what you've created in the first place, because knowing, understanding the mission statement of the organization that you're applying to, or the network that you're hoping to reach, or the mindset that you're wanting to capture, um, should induce you to make some fine-tuning and some tweaks before you, before you put it in there. Um, how many of you were at the previous uh, presentation on pitching? Great. Um, this has become this has become the kind of watershed uh, experience. Um, there there have been a few things written online recently, and I'll quote I'll quote one of them. A Scottish filmmaker said that pitching events um, have begun to look like. Uh, um, going into a strip club and you know, making the filmmaker feel like a pole dancer in front of a bunch of guys in business suits except with less dignity. <laughs> um, I, I, I'm, I'm sure that it feels that way sometimes. And uh, there is this competitive atmosphere that, that is you know, sort of inherent in, in uh, the format or the forum. Um, Trying to keep that collegial tone with your colleagues and the sharing and the reinforcing and the support is, is important. As soon as we start to close down and get very guarded about our information, I think is when everybody loses out. Um, in, in this day and age, if we're not sharing information and comparing notes, we're, we're living in isolation and depression. You, know? you, you, you need to let off steam with one another you need to compare notes on what experiences have been. Um, the more of that that's done, the better I think it is for, for all of us. The pitch events are important. I won't deny that. Um, and 
even if you start out by saying I'm not someone who likes, I, I don't like speaking publicly, I can't do that. Well, you noticed in, in one of the, the uh, I guess it was the third pitch because I was watching downstairs, but um, uh, the, the filmmaker explained that she was quite shy, she didn't like doing this, but um, this too can, you know, not everyone has to be a show person in the same way. You know, be true to yourself, be true to the project, um, feel that if you prepare well and, and practice, um, you will be able to effectively communicate your idea. And, and everybody's got a different style, and, the, and just because your style is different doesn't mean that it can't work. Um, start out by going to some of these events as an observer so you know what to expect. Um, you know what it looks like and smells like and feels like and recognize that today nobody walks away from these events with a check in their pocket. You know, that's not how it works. In a sense, the pitch events have become part of the early stages of the promotion and marketing of the film. And, and so think of it in these terms. If you do a good job of your pitch and you start some conversations going, even if a deal doesn't emerge from that within the next few months, you've made some new connections and you're going to keep yourself on the radar of that decision maker over a period of time. It, that will help to foreshorten the time needed to, to sell the film once it is finished. So it's all part of investing in the same process and the same ultimate goal. So, you know, don't be turned off to the pitch events just because it feels sort of too personally challenging or whatever. Um, packaging, this, this goes to uh, what I was saying earlier about being prepared in, in having different versions of, uh, of your material ready and, and being, you know, facile with it, being at ease with it. Um, don't forget that the decision maker is the audience for the proposal. In other words, you're not writing a proposal as though you're writing it for the viewer. You're writing it for a decision maker, and that's a little bit different. You never want to say to a decision maker, I know exactly what's going to work for your audience, because you don't. And they want to believe that they are, um, of course, supremely in command of, of what works in, within their grant giving organization or their network or whatever it may be. But you still need to appeal to them. How many here saw the, um, uh, the Sunday, uh, New York Times Sunday Magazine article on Kickstarter? Definitely worth looking it up um, and reading it. Uh, I, I, what it reinforces is that ultimately you're still dealing with gatekeepers. You know, even if you go the crowdfunding route, you still have to get over the hurdle of appealing to somebody in the first instance and trying to decipher what that is while maintaining the integrity of your idea is a delicate balance. But again, you know, knowing and understanding who they are or what seems to be working in that environment will help you determine whether it's worth doing or not. Um, you know, in, in, again, uh, making sure that in your proposal it's clear to the reader that you are prepared to make the one hour version or adapt it even further if your intent is the educational audience, uh, that, that you see your film being broken down into three 20 minute parts uh, that can be meant for classroom use or, you know, again, the knowledge about who the end user is will help determine what it is you want to say about the format. Um, I think that, that a lot of European filmmakers are much more accustomed to writing in terms that, that sound as though they come from the filmmaking academy. Um, and so they will use terminology that will describe their approach and it, and it sounds kind of like classic film school. Um, that may feel a bit um, stilted or, or, or stiff for, um, for North Americans, but Nonetheless, you need to be able to say stylistically what your approach is. And <clears throat> several of the projects that I've seen in, in the last day and a half have managed to tell me everything about the story and the subject, um, but not what the style of the film is. And you've got to be able to do that on paper. Um, thinking visually, uh, it's very surprising how few proposals have um, real description 
of visual elements um, or, or help to create atmosphere. So, you know, just have that in mind. If your project is something that you really feel is going to work internationally, and you can't just say it's a universal theme because everyone dies, um, you, you, you really have to be able to share a, a, a few more things about what makes it cross-cultural. And you need to be informed. And that's where this whole business that I mentioned earlier about researching what else has been done and knowing what else is out there and what the approach has been is going to be important. Um, marquee value. Uh, I, I think that, again, you know, we, we here and on this continent are very driven by ideas of, you know, the iconoclastic filmmaker and the, the, the media maker and, and so on. Um, if you're starting out and you don't have the track record, think about who can come into your team as a consultant, consulting producer, consulting editor, consulting writer, um, who can add value to your marquee. Um, you may even be able to formulate a relationship where you will uh, work your way under the umbrella of a more established production company. Um, this may not really cost you anything. And so it might be their name or, or your name in association with such and such film production. Um, don't feel that you're giving up something or you're losing your identity to do that. I'm, I mean, everyone talks, you know, so loosely about, oh, film is a collaborative medium. Um, it is. And uh, be willing to do more of that or find relationships that will allow you to do the work you want with, um, let's say, that, that, that fairy godmother, you know, safe wing under which you can park yourself. And, and uh, in a sense, that helps to confer credibility on you. Um, uh, decision makers will say, well, if that company, if that producer of such reputation has in a sense vetted this project, that helps reinforce um, my positive feelings about it. Um, I am the first person to say that uh, when I look at a proposal, um, if there is a strong editor or a strong DP attached, to me that says a lot. Um, because I know that um, editors, you know, they, they, it's not just work for hire. Um, editors for whom features, documentary features, are uh, important to them and a mainstay of their work, they don't just casually lend their names to things. And if you can make a relationship like that, it says so much. Um, oftentimes, decision makers will say, if I know that there is a strong editor on board, it gives me just an incredible level of confidence. I've looked at the quality of the material. The shooting is good. The audio is good. They've got access. But the key thing in the end is the editor. And, and just have that in mind. Um, you know, DP can work in similar ways. Uh, you know, this, the, the business about endorsements, I think anybody who has worked in the public television environment is, is accustomed to this idea that when you send in um, funding proposals to, uh, to certain uh, public entities, you're being asked for letters of reference. You know what? It doesn't hurt. If you have a name filmmaker or uh, an academic or someone who's willing to say nice things about you, include it in the proposal and have it available to send along as a package to someone. Um, so think about cultivating those things. Um, frankly, it's also a way of engendering a, a, a closer involvement with what you're doing, sometimes from key people. I mean, they, you can make them feel good in that you've asked them for that. And um, it's a testimony to, to your relationship to share with others. Ah. Oh. This is marketing and promotion. It seems like, you know, in a way, this has become uh, to filmmaking what research is. Um, uh, it's something that you start at a very early stage, and you're continuing it all the way through production. It's another job that is in your lap. Um, uh, I will say to people who um, who do not have some kind of shooting risk involved. Um, uh, or a hazardous work environment, 
um, or let's say surreptitious filming or something like that. In other words, if there's no reason that your work or your project has to be kept secret, the sooner you start your own website for that project, the better. You may begin by having a place on your site where the project can live. Um, but bear in mind that so many decision makers will do their research about, um, uh, about you and your project online. If the title comes up and it takes them to a place that you control the editorial content of, all the better. Bringing people into your environment, the environment that you control, can be very helpful. Um, I'm, I'm of mixed view about the value of, of blogging as you go along, um, as you're making the film. I think with certain kinds of funders, this can be a very key component in the relationship. And that's something to think about, is how do you go through the process of keeping funders, supporters, you know, the, 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 the chorus of friends informed about what you're doing. What's the best way to do that? Blogging might be an answer. Newsletter might be an answer. But um, communicating with greater, increasing numbers of people is very important. I think it's quite hard when, you know, filmmakers go away on location or they're, you know, they're caught up in a freelance job. And, you know, people start wondering, well, I wonder what happened to that. I mean, if you can, if you can shoot something out there regularly and keep keep your name in front of them. That's a, a, a key piece of it. Um, just wanted to talk for a minute about this whole idea of sample material and what it is you show people. Um, you know, back in the day, it was the trailer and the proposal. Um, now, decision makers feel so jaded about, um, about trailers. Eh, they're too polished. They're, you know, that's not what the film really is. How many filmmakers, they show me the trailer, they say, well, this gives you an idea, but it's not really what the film is. I, I mean, they have their place, and, and, and there, there is use for them, but there are other samples of your material that can be made to work. I was very heartened to see a number of filmmakers that I've met with the last day and a half <clears throat> who had um, longer samples. And... I often urge people, if you've got the material in hand and you can create a reel of, say, 20 minutes, use title cards liberally in between some cut scenes. You can call it selects. You can call it selected scenes, whatever. Um, the title cards will help set it up. If this is a way of showing the scope of your material, then so be it. That is probably, in a lot of ways, going to be more useful to you than repolishing a trailer. Um, you know, we used to be able to represent material as rough because when we cut on film, you had grease marks on it and, and uh, you know, pieces of leader where the archive was going to go. And I know I sound like I'm. A million years old, and I am a Luddite. I do sometimes wish we were still making films on film. Okay, I said it. Um, but in, in, in fact, something that looks too polished can be off-putting. And uh, there, there is this idea that if you, in a sense, over-create something, you're going to box yourself in. So early on, these sample pieces that are not represented to be contiguous film um, could be very helpful. <coughs> the Brits refer to tasters, taster tapes. Sometimes they mean the same thing as a trailer. Um, other times, what they're referring to is actually just a short piece or two of selects, um, real selects. In other words, raw material, not cut, not, you know, nothing much done to it, no polish, no mix, no nothing. Um, you know, your project may benefit from having a few of those. Uh, okay, marketing and promotion, relationships. Um, this, is, this is back to the idea that um, keeping in touch with people and um, staying in communication, if someone says no, that doesn't have to be the end of your discussion with them. Um, keep the door open, you know, don't, don't be hurt, don't take it personally, don't, don't, you know, don't walk away in a huff. Uh, realize that in, in, it's a very small world that we're dealing in, you're going to be seeing them again, and uh, the next time around, 
uh, you, you want to have that door open and, and be able to continue. And you know what? If you have the sense that they may connect with you eventually, keep them on the mailing list for the newsletter. Um, they can unsubscribe if they want to. Uh, but in the interim, they may be interested in getting updates. Um, as, as I spoke, I had breakfast with some clients of mine this morning, and they said, yep, it's definitely a marathon. It's not a sprint these days. There are no fast solutions to the funding questions. So be prepared for this idea that it is long term. I, I have had uh, a lot of people who have said, um, well, such and such an event is happening in six months. Can I raise the money by then? You know, not unless manna falls from heaven is the answer. So really thinking far in advance. Um, <clears throat> just quickly, it's not over until the film is out there. And even once the film is out there, then you're still helping to keep it out there. It's kind of the, you know, you, you, you have children and you think that by the time they're 18, they're gone and living their own lives. I don't think anybody thinks that anymore. So um, just qu very quickly, festival strategy. Please do not rely, it, this, is, this is not a, a business condemnation, but do not rely on without a box. Um, first of all, they don't have every festival in the world. And uh, Britfilms.com is a searchable database. It's, it's sponsored by the nonprofit British Council. Uh, it's an excellent uh, source of festival information. And you can search it by submission deadlines as well as by when the festival takes place. So you can really map out a strategy. And a festival strategy is important. You want to, you want a first tier of festivals, and at a certain point, uh, you want yourself or, or to have someone else who will start asking for screening fees because when you start getting into you know, eight months out or nine months out, uh, those fees can be an important source of income for you. You should be prepared to ask for screening fees and travel and speaking fees if you've got the subject where having you there with the film is real value added. Again, this is all part of you know, building your war chest for making the next project. You've got to have income coming in. Um, PR, a lot of disagreement among filmmakers about whether it's worth hiring PR agents for major festivals or not. I would talk to your peers and make sure that if you're going to put out that kind of cash that you are definitely going to get a return for it. I mean, I know too many tales of people who spent thousands of dollars for a publicist at Sundance or wherever and, you know, the press kits didn't even get distributed. Um, Distributors, this is a more complicated conversation than I think we have time for right now, but um, uh, thinking about your distribution strategy, if you listen to Peter Broderick, you've got a set of ideas uh, about how much of it you can do yourself. There, are, there is a value to an agent and a distributor, and, and your project may need kind of a, a, a specialized handling. Um, All of this is in service to building your career. So how you go about this initially and how you manage your assets. You know, your film is an asset and you want it earning money for you out there over time. If you're getting small checks from a, an educational distributor over the next few years, I mean, that's money that helps keep the lights on and the rent paid and maybe gets you the plane ticket you need to do the research trip on the other film. You cannot overlook any of these income producing opportunities. Um, and there are a range of them out there. None of us believe that right now the digital world is somehow going to make up for the ground that we've lost in, uh, in television and in other funding uh, environments. Um, so we have to be very, we really have to husband our resources and manage them carefully and not overlook any, any possibilities. Um, Working on reviews and, and media coverage and uh, other people to blog about you and this kind of thing, again, it starts to feel very self-involved and very narcissistic, and, but you've got to find a way to kind of keep the flame going and keep it alive. Um, in the end, uh, that's it. A lot of work, but um, we do have some wonderful examples in the, uh, in, in the independent film environment these days of uh, films that I think we can all feel 
a sense of connection with for the kind of success that they've created and, and not just looking at it with our noses pressed against the glass of, oh, gee, I wish I could be that, but understand that what it took were a lot of these building blocks. So it's no magic bullet, but I hope that it provided a little bit of insight. Thank you. You talked about in budgeting the importance of budgeting in enough for your producer and director to actually get paid. What is considered a reasonable salary, fee, whatever, uh, based on weekly, based on annually? How, what is considered reasonable by people looking at budgets? Um, there, there's no hard answer to that, except that what I would say to you is that if you were compressing the time needed to make the film into six months or a year. <clears throat> and the idea was, if you're thinking of this as, uh, th this would occupy someone's time full time for six months, and you had in your budget $30,000, $40,000, nobody can really brush that off. Because you're often talking about decision makers whose own salaries on a per annum basis are, are going to be in that range. Um, so I would say th think in terms of numbers which are reasonable in the, in the wider world, not relative to what the top day rate of such and such a person is freelance, but think of it more as an annual salary that is meant to support a person in a, you know, in a reasonably dignified way living in a city. Does that help? Yes. I think it's more in the range that I was talking of, where where it's in the. If you're looking at six months for a producer, full time, it, you're you're putting something down that is the, in the thirty to sixty range. Um, that's going to then translate better in Europe, where where fees are not as high. Um, and you may make some adjustment for that. <coughs> Remember that in budgeting, it is more defensible to have smaller line items than to have large chunks. If, if you get into a discussion with a, um, a finance manager at a network, uh, because they're talking about investing $150,000 in the film, and they want to have some budget approval, you want to be able to defend every line item. If every line item is, is composed of smaller bits rather than large chunks, it's harder for them to argue about that. Now, your personnel costs are outside of that category, but you have a lot of other categories where you can build things in. And that's why you know, legal and insurance and uh, a lot of smaller things the places where I don't see numbers for, uh, the numbers of budgets where I don't see numbers for E&O insurance and for um, tape masters, uh, for conversion to PAL and, you know, up conversion and all of these details, making sure that those are adequate or in some cases exceeding a reasonable level will help you overcome some of those other issues with your personnel costs. Does that help? I know you're wanting something more definite about being in New York and, and, and budgeting for life here, but you know, you're, going to, you're going to have something that moves around a little bit. In a way, I'd like to take that question and look at it from another point of view, because it, it's very disheartening. You know, I, I have an editor. The editor makes 3500 a week. That's what she wants to make. That's what she makes as an independent film editor, and she gets jobs for more than that. If you have a really good DP, it really costs money. The lawyer is going to charge what a lawyer charges. And as a director and producer, my line item is less money than what I made when I was 20 years old. Now, I think this is a very good question, since this is the kind of presentation that you made. If if a producer director puts a line item in for themselves that's you know commensurate with what even a public television 
producer director makes or whatever the you know whatever is c considered reasonable for somebody who's making a film because many of us are making films that honestly uh, if things were shifted a little we would be hired by a television company conceivably to make because they would realize the value in it but I, 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 I think that to take your analogy a little bit further television companies now there is so much work that is being done out of house on the cheap. You know, and this is where this idea that just say no. Um, within these four walls, uh, the, the numbers of, co of small production companies that have literally been bankrupted by cable companies who squeeze them for every cent, where you're talking about a, an, an hourly budget figure that the network is prepared to give them that is not what the value, what the real cost of that hour is. And they say, well, we'll give you 10 of those hours. Surely you can find savings. You know, surely there's an economy of scale. Filmmakers, producers, small production companies have to be prepared to say, no, guess what, you can't actually do it. Everyone then says to me, but if I turn them down, they'll go to someone else who will accept it. I don't have an answer to that, other than a kind of 1930s labor organizing tactic, which is, <laughs> You know, come on, if we don't all disabuse yeah, people IOPs. of what things really cost, then, then it's going to just perpetuate itself. But then to answer another piece of, of what you mentioned, in the public television funding environment, there is a much greater awareness of the true costs in the way that you're describing. Um, and so if you're making an application to CPB or NEA or NEH, the kinds of figures that you're referring to are much more within their frame of experience. Now, those grants are rarer, they're harder to come by, um, they're bigger chunks, uh, but the budget figures that you're referring to of editors being paid at that level and so on and so forth is much more what they're accustomed to seeing. In Europe, no. European television, no. But then again, uh, the the it, it it's considered there aren't the the kind of celebrity editors or you know if I dare refer to it that way I don't mean anything negative by that by the way because again greatest respect for editors well um, you know when you when you when you and I'm sure everybody in this room is that well maybe everybody hasn't had this experience and I hope nobody has to have this experience but you start using interns and you find that you know after three months your Final Cut Pro is all fucked up and you're <laughs> You know, you've wasted three months of your life and you would have been better off hiring an editor if you had the money that really knew what they were doing instead of, you know, having somebody do mm -hmm. what, you know, what you sort of put out there. But I, 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 um, I don't know if there's time for this and I don't know if you have this information, but I was hoping that part of this there might be some sense of new sources of funding that you know, deal with this field as sort of respectfully as it deserves to be dealt with? I know that's a big question. Um, there aren't any new sources of funding. You know, everyone is thinking that the, that the online environment is, is going to fill that gap, and it's just not. Um, uh, you know, the Ford Foundation, we're, we're I, I, you know, I think we're waiting to see. Um, are certain other philanthropies um, going to step in and, you know, the MacArthur Media Fund and, and you know, we are seeing other, other foundations, other philanthropies are starting to um, open up again to film and to media. You know, we, we did go through a terrible time when a lot of that shut down in the, you know, in the early 90s. A lot of those funding sources stopped putting money into film because, frankly, if your choice is between a storefront soup kitchen, I'm talking about the last recession, the, the, the storefront soup kitchen or a film about hunger, you fund the storefront soup kitchen. So there, there was a lot that, that squeezed, a lot of doors closed. And now there, some things are opening again. The other thing to be aware of, and I mean, you know, I live in Maine. Uh, total population is about, you know, 1.34 million. But I keep my ear to the ground because what you start to realize is that some philanthropies, their asset base changes. It's not just Bernie, Bernie Madoff's Ponzi scheme has robbed philanthropies of money. Sometimes philanthropies have their asset base increase 
because of um, a tr uh, one of their trustees has passed away and left a lot of their estate or whatever. And there are shifts in that environment that can signal or point to uh, a source that you may not have been aware of before. But is there some new category? No, not that I'm aware of anyway. Thank, thank you so much, Ms. Rosen. Your presentation is fantastic. Thank um, you. I have a, a question regarding um, if you were to budget in, um, say, a rather large portion of a budget is comprising of equipment that um, essentially makes more, more financial sense to purchase rather than rent because rental costs are extraordinary, so it really doesn't make much sense to spend three quarters or even more of the purchase price on rentals. So how do you factor in, say, if you're working on a $300,000 budget and you've got $90,000 in equipment purchase prices? Um, it, it won't fly. It won't fly. And that is, you know, that's one of the challenges of, um, of growing your business as a filmmaker is that threshold that you have to go over where um, th those equipment acquisitions can become part of your asset base and can also be something that in every single film you're renting your own equipment, the cost of your own equipment um, is part of the budget and it's paying for itself in that way. But of course you need you know, you need that, that financing to be able to make that purchase. You can't put that in a budget. Okay, thank I you. I mean, uh, n no sources that I know of will happily accept that. Um, even if you're talking about a highly specialized piece of equipment, you know, in the IMAX world, for example, where the equipment isn't sold anyway, but y you know what I'm saying. It's like just... A, like a red system. Right. One of the new red systems. Yeah. Just a quick question about other possible sources of financing. You know, have you explored anything? Because I've started to do this, depending on the project, in terms of uh, sponsors, corporate sponsors that might fit into a project. I mean, in a subtle way, not as a commercial, obvious commercial uh, placement, but yeah. some sort of subtle possibilities. Um, I hear more often about um, some, some corporate entities who are prepared uh, with um, quite specific films um, to provide some financial support um, and, and to get some branding for themselves out of that. Um, and you know in the public television environment there used to be people who were independent agents who went out and did just that. And for reasons that are not clear to me, um, those people dropped from the scene. All of that corporate development work went in-house uh, in, in the public television world. <clears throat> and and I, was, I was no longer seeing or hearing about uh, people who were doing this on a, on a kind of freelance, out-of-house basis. I've started to hear a few names again. People who have come to a point in their careers, they used to be in the advertising marketing world, they have good corporate connections within certain product categories or certain areas of activity, and they, they've had their successes, they now want a sense of satisfaction in being able to help people get projects funded. Um, but it's very much people not working on a national basis. You know, I've heard of somebody in Boston, and I've heard of somebody in, uh, in Portland, Oregon, and you know, again, it's seeking out someone who possibly comes from an advertising and marketing background and, and can serve in that role. Uh, but there's not an organized business out there. There are real screen, um, the, P, the real screen magazine who do the real screen summit, I think starting next week, they have an event called the Branded Entertainment Forum. Now you can just imagine what that's like. Um, on the other hand, if I could be a fly on the wall there, I think I would get a lot of ideas that fit into, you know, what you're referring to. It's got to fit the project, obviously. Yeah, right. Oh, oh sorry. Next. <laughs> yeah, it's about um, third-party um, footage and um, uh -huh. visuals, et cetera, music rights, whatever. Um, having that line item in the budget be specific when you don't have a rough cut yet, so I don't have specific needle drop info for each of them or you know, how much I, I'm in touch with these people. I 
um, have permission so far for the trailer, the rights are all cleared, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but as far as the final film and trying to finish the film and get funding to finish the film, that's been one of the holes in my budget is that I can't give a specific, so I don't know whether they're gonna be charging a million dollars or a hundred dollars. Right. Uh, starting to, being able to look someone in the eye and say, I've had a preliminary conversation, even though I don't know how many minutes or seconds I'm using, I do know that the rates will fall in this range because I've had the discussions. That's important. So that at least the figure that you're putting into the budget represents, you know, how would you say a kind of worst case scenario? Um, that, that I think is valuable. But the big problem that indies are having now is that when it comes to motion footage that is controlled by a studio, they do not want to play ball. Anybody had experience with that here? I, you know, I know so many filmmakers now who are uh, wanting a, a, a little clip of this or that of something that's been studio released. And, you know, this, in, in, in the effort to contain their costs, um, a lot of studios are just not even considering it. What does it matter to them that an independent filmmaker wants to license, you know, 45 seconds of, uh, of, of some Hollywood film? It doesn't. And just a corollary to that, yeah. I've got a layer of um, a rights clearance because I filmed a dance performer. The choreographer made a deal with Philip Glass. Phil, the music he used was from Philip Glass's movie, not specifically for that dance thing. So it was like, three different layers trying to figure out what I needed to get or not get and how to work through that. Um, and my last little thing is why doesn't the NEA sub um, fund fiscally sponsored projects? Um, I'm not quite clear on your question. Um, it, was, it was just You mean why, why will they, why are they I, not you, prepared to go? If you look at the NEA, it, it, they're supposed to be supporting artists and they only support conglomerates or corporations or I have to incorporate myself as a 501c3 but I can't have a fiscal sponsor it says in the fourth line if you look right on the first page and I just um, think that's horrendous the NEH does but not the NEA right and and what I've heard about how people have gone around this has it has been by making um, making that kind of production partnership with somebody who already is a 501c3 not someone who acts merely as a pass-through but, but a, another production company who already has that status. I think we've been told that we need to wrap, so um, I'm happy to talk outside if you wish. Thank you very much. <laughs>